The lesson is don't trust colonizers. My sleep schedule is so bad. <laughs> I'm literally nocturnal at this point. Um, it's the middle of the night. I'm fucked. Let's just hang out. Let's just talk about books. I'm gonna talk about books while I cut some mangoes. For some reason, people like seeing me multitask while I talk about books, whether it's folding laundry or cooking. Now that I think about it, it might be because you always roast me in the comments because I do laundry and I cook very badly. So you'll see how badly I cut mangoes as well. I got my cutting board. I got my peeler. I got my Hello Kitty PJs and we're ready to go. In the spirit of the holidays, I'm also doing a giveaway because this video has been sponsored by Book of the Month. Book of the Month is a super popular and fast growing online book service. Their team vets hundreds of books each month to curate a selection of new and early release books. Their mission is to promote new and emerging authors to help readers discover new books that they love. This is a really good opportunity to give a gift to your friends or your family and actually give a gift where they can choose the book that they wanna read instead of you guessing. There's three gifting options that they have. One of them is three months for $49.99, six months for $89.99, and 12 months for $169.99. But no matter what kind of subscription you get, you're gonna get a good deal anyway, because these are brand new hardcover books that you're not gonna get the same price at like a regular bookstore. I have two gift cards with me for six months of book of the month. So I will be doing a giveaway for those two cards. I will put a Google form in my description below. And it's the perfect gift for social distancing because you don't need to to leave your house to buy it. You can go ahead and enter my giveaway below or you can check out the links that I have if you wanna see all the other gift options. Okay, so let's do the finally fall book tag. I am gonna try to only answer what books I've read this year because if I try to look back on all the books I've read ever, it will just take way too much time to think about all that. In fall, the air is crisp and clear. Name a book with a vivid setting. First one that comes to mind for this is actually a book that I read recently, which is Catherine House. I wouldn't consider this book vivid in the sense where there was like a lot of description, but more so in the atmosphere that the author had established. It's a very low key horror novel about this school in Pennsylvania where college students can try to apply. It's very competitive to get in there because they have tons of perks where you don't have to pay for tuition. There's free room and board covered. And everyone who has graduated from there is like super successful because they're like a Supreme Court justice or like an award-winning author author. It's like a really big deal to get in there. It very much feels gothic. The house is just dusty, crusty, and musty as Chanel would say. It's like super old and worn down and then like when the students all get together for their little assembly they have to chant this weird ritual. Like they have to close their eyes and keep on chanting the same phrases over and over like as a fucking cult because it basically is. It's just like a creepy book because you don't know what they're up to but you just know it's super sus. This is the kind of book where there isn't really a plot but it's more just on what the setting is and the kind of eerie atmosphere that the author conveys. And just like the drowsy sense of feeling that you get when you're in the main character's head, like you're kind of disassociating it a little bit. The next one is nature is beautiful, but also dying. Name a book that is beautifully written, but also deals with a heavy topic like loss or grief. I've read quite a few books like this, but I think one that hasn't been really talked about that often would be Transcendent Kingdom. It is about this girl who is a fifth year student at Stanford University. She's studying to be a neuroscientist and so she's been cooped up in a lab experimenting with mice to figure out more about behavior when it comes to depression and addiction. And she was really interested in that because she has had a lot of really, really sad experiences in her own life. And so you see that interspersed as you read through the book where you see like her present day uh, chilling in the lab and then you see like way back in the past where traumatic shit happens. It is a established that her mother is currently dealing with depression, like to the point where she can't get out of bed. That's a mood. And she had an older brother who was an athlete, but then he got addicted to heroin and he ended up dying at an early age. So that's why she decides to study it because she's been through so much loss and grief in her life that trying to view it from a clinical perspective through science is just her way of trying to make sense out of the things that have happened throughout her life. At the same time though, the book also juggles with her kind of 
deciding between science that she's studying for and faith because she grew up in a family of immigrants from Ghana and her mom was like super religious. And so she's questioning the idea of God and the promise of salvation. It's a book that kind of questions like, well, can you have both at the same time? Because usually science and religion are seen as opposites. It's a very thoughtful book, super sad, obviously, but I think there's a lot of emotional depth to it. I think if you are a very spiritual person, then you might resonate with this book more than I did. But I think that this would be a good book to answer for the prompt because it's asking for heavy topic like loss or grief. And I think we always associate that with death, but I think there's like another layer of grief that you have to deal with when someone in your life deals with addiction or depression as well. So if you wanna have a bad time, <laughs> then you can check that book out. Fall is back to school season. Share a nonfiction book that taught you something new. I read a couple of nonfiction books throughout the year. I'm gonna go with one of the earliest nonfic books I read, which was Over the Top by Jonathan Van Ness. He is one of the members of the Queer Eye cast. If you don't know, Queer Eye is a reality show that was rebooted on Netflix and it follows four gay men and one non-binary person, which is Jonathan in this case. And each episode, they go around the Midwest and help transform someone's life. It's a show that's focused on self-improvement and self-care. And that's why I like to watch it because even though I definitely don't have that by watching it, I feel like I'm gonna get that through osmosis or something. But it's a very feel good show. Each person is an expert on a particular thing like cooking or interior design or fashion. Jonathan is the grooming expert. So he's focused on hair, skincare, other types of self care. But I think what stands out most about him is just his infectious personality. He definitely has the most a uh, loud personality out of everyone in the group. Um, he's very flamboyant, very chipper and cheerful a lot of the time. And I was interested in reading his memoir because he talks a lot about the horrible things that have happened throughout his life and even the horrible things that he's done in the past. He grew up in a small Midwestern town, so I pretty much knew that he was likely bullied growing up because just that geographic area and that time period, people weren't really understanding of others on the LGBT spectrum. So I already knew that. What I didn't know and what I learned from reading this book was just the extent of all the really difficult shit that he went through. In the book, he talks about how he was abused by an older boy at church when he was really young and that developed a lot of self-esteem issues, a lot of body issues, and also a sex addiction that became very prevalent for him as he was growing up as a teenager. He also became addicted to cocaine and once he ran out of money to afford all of that, he started selling his body just so that he can get more drugs. He also, as an early teen, he would go like on AOL chat rooms and talk to older men and solicit sex from them. He found out he had HIV around the same time that his dad died and also around the same time that his first serious relationship ended. And he also went to rehab twice and he relapsed twice. The list pretty much goes on and on. He's been through a lot of shit. I wasn't necessarily surprised by learning about these things, but they are still new things that I discovered while reading this book about him. And I think the reason why I wanted to read about that, knowing the type of sad shit that I would be uncovering, is that I find this weird sense of comfort in seeing someone who is so like successful, who is so positive and cheerful and vibrant like he is right now. And knowing that he's went through so much crap in the past and like so much trauma that so many times you don't think that you'll be able to get out of it or be in a better place. And so that's why I find it comforting to learn about the dark moments in someone's past because I think that just makes them like more human. I like learning those things about people because it makes me think like, damn, if they can get through that shit, maybe I can too. Number four, in order to keep warm, it's good to spend some time with the people we love. Name a fictional family slash household slash friend group that you would like to be a part of. For this one, I'm gonna go with the Brown family from the books Get a Life, Chloe Brown, and Take a Hint, Danny Brown, and another book that's coming out soon with the youngest sister. So this is a romance series, but each book 
book is a standalone. Each book focuses on one sister and their respective love interests. And it's a super cute book. It gets very steamy. And I think that that would be a great family to be a part of because first of all, all the sisters seem very cool. Like all of them are very self-assured and have a strong sense of personality, which I think is a good environment to be in. Like you need to surround yourself with self-assured women like that to kind of empower you. They're also rich. They come from money. So I would like to be like that. I was talking to my friend last night who was complaining about people who are well off, but she was like, no, you're different though, because you actually worked hard for your money. And I'm like, nah, screw that. I want to be a trust fund kid. I don't want to work hard for my money. I want to be so rich that I can just hire somebody to slice my own mango so that I don't have to do this shit in the middle of the night while I'm on a mental breakdown. Like it would just make my life so much easier. By the way, I am currently slicing three mangoes. That's why everything is taking much longer. Mangoes are just my favorite food, okay? I just want to live a little. And then the third reason is there is a pretty clear trend as you keep reading the books that all the sisters keep on running into really really sweet dudes as their love interests like they're all very emotionally intelligent they all go to therapy do you know how rare it is for a man to go to therapy they're very like sensitive and considerate they like care about the main character's well-being they're super nice to them it's just like what people like that exist Sounds fake, but okay. I would gladly be a part of the Brown Sisters so that I could be surrounded by strong women and money and follow the trend of meeting a nice hot himbo who will take care of me and possibly slice my own mango so that I don't have to do it. Number five, the colorful leaves are piling up on the ground. Show us a pile of fall colored spines. I am gonna pick physical books from my TBR. I'll just cut to a clip of Future Cindy showing that to you because my hands are sticky from the mango. I have three books on my physical TBR that I think are kind of fall colored. I mean, they're just brown <laughs> if that's close enough the first one is uh, a book that i'm reading right now it's called magic lessons by alice hoffman i'm still early on in the book so i don't really know what it is about exactly all i know is that it's a historical fantasy novel it is about witches and the main character she has like a lesson she needs to learn which is always love someone who will love you back and at some point she's gonna get betrayed by the man who once declared his love for her so Sounds like realistic fiction to me. Anyway, the next book that uh, is on my TBR is Wabi Sabi for artists, designers, poets, and philosophers. This was a gift from Jackie. Wabi Sabi is a Japanese aesthetic, but the author is white. So I'm interested in seeing what this white man will teach me. And then the last book is At the Wolf's Table. This is a historical novel that Sierra gave to me. I'm trying not to read or remember the synopsis because I lately have been kind of just liking diving into books without knowing anything about it. But I do remember that the tagline for this book had said something about how the main character joins a group of women who are being ordered to be Hitler's taste testers. But I don't know what the plot is actually about. So we'll see. And these are my fall colored spines. Number six, fall is the perfect time for some storytelling by the fireside. Share a book wherein somebody is telling a story. I'm gonna get a little bit creative with this and choose You Had Me at Ola. This is another romance book that features two telenovela actors who are telling a story through a telenovela. They're filming this drama for the streaming service. So the main character is a soap opera star who gets this opportunity to be on the show. Her love interest is, of course, the other male lead. They kind of have an awkward beginning at first because he spills coffee on her, which is very confusing to me because he's supposed to be this hot dude and then he's just like a bumbling, klutzy idiot. So I wasn't really buying into the romance, but I I think this book fulfills the prompt of someone telling a story because you get to watch the way that they interact in real life while they're trying to figure out how they can convey a believable romance for this TV show. And it's also complicated because they're starting to develop feelings in real life. So then if you start to fall for your co-star, that gets kind of awkward when you have to like make out with them for, you know, the cameras. But also the book emphasizes on the importance of telling Latinx stories. They really go all in on Latinx representation, which is having all the cast members, all the crew members on the production be Latinx and the characters routinely talking about how it's so important for them to 
to share this story in mainstream America and have telenovelas be more of like a thing and have more faces like theirs. Okay, I got one mango pit done, two more to go. I know you're curious about how I slice my mango so that you can figure out how to make fun of me for it. They are very badly misshaped. No shape is the same, but that's what makes it all unique. Also, it doesn't matter because it's all gonna end up in the same place anyway and come out in the same place anyway. Mango is one of those fruits where it's okay if it's misshapen because it still is gonna taste good no matter what. The next question says, the nights are getting darker, share a dark and creepy read. I really wanted to avoid picking any of the books I read most recently, but for this one, I feel like I have to say Mexican Gothic because I don't really read horror that often, and this was just one of the rare times where I did read horror, and it was pretty dark and creepy. Not in like a scary way, but definitely in a creepy way. It's a book that follows this girl who gets a letter from her cousin who is married to this dude that's living in the countryside and her cousin is telling her, hey, get me the fuck out of here. I don't like this place. And so the main girl's dad is like, hey, you should check up on her and see what's going on. So she visits the cousin's house. Well, it's technically the cousin's husband's house. And already she just gets the worst vibes from that place. Like it's just, something's off. First of all, they don't have any electricity in the house. And whenever they have dinner, one of the rules is that they have to be quiet the whole time. Like no one's allowed to talk at all. It's just very weird. They're very rigid. And uh, <laughs> they give me like white supremacist vibes because they're super into eugenics. They are British colonizers who have had a history of hiring these Mexican miners who have mysteriously died from some kind of illness. But the creepiest parts, in my opinion, is the dreams that the main character has while she's staying over at the house. They start off with like kind of strange, surreal dreams. They get kind of bloody, kind of gory, which is like, eh, whatever. But then she starts having weird dreams about a particular dude in the house that forces himself upon her. And so to read those dreams where she felt like she had no control of her body and this dude was like being slimy and gross to her and she didn't even know if it was actually a dream or if it was real or not, was just what made it the creepiest part for me. Also, there's a part where like this other old dude literally vomits inside this girl's mouth. I can't explain why, cause that would be spoilers, but it's just like really fucking weird. The lesson is don't trust colonizers. Next question, the days are getting colder. Name a short heartwarming read that could warm up somebody's cold and rainy day. And I'm gonna go with The Kiss Quotient by Helena Huang. I read this, I think like in the earlier half of the year and it was just so cute. It's a novel about an autistic woman who is a super duper map genius, but she is very, awkward when it comes to picking up social cues. She's not quite good with like relationships. The author is autistic herself, so this is an own voices book. So she's super talented, super smart, but she knows nothing about dating. And so she decides, her own logic tells her, well, okay, so I need to get better at dating. It would only make sense if I hire someone to teach me how to date properly and get better at it. So what she does is she hires a male escort to be basically like her practice boyfriend. Well, first she learns more of like the physical practices and that was hot, but then she requests to learn more about like the emotional boyfriend side of things. And that's when things get kind of tricky because he starts to develop real feelings for her. I mean, she does too, but I just love it more when the guy pines over her. And it's such a cute book, I think because the guy is just so like, sensitive and sweet to her. Like he's really understanding of her. He's super patient. He loves it when she gets excited about work. Like her being excited about work is not a bad thing. I feel like that is so common to see in a lot of like rom-com. Someone is a career woman, so that means they must be uptight and they can't like let loose and being super absorbed into your career is a bad thing. But really he admires how much she loves math and how she's so excited by it. And also like the pining was super sweet. Was it realistic? I mean, <laughs> not really, but that's how you have it be heartwarming, right? Because real life isn't like that. He fell for her so quick. It made no sense, but I didn't care because <laughs> I thought it was cute anyway. I want to hire a male escort just so that they can come over and slice my mangoes for me. Wouldn't that be so cute? Wouldn't that be so wholesome? And then we'll have another kind of wholesome later that night. Fall returns every year. Name an old favorite that you would like to return to soon. For this one, I'm gonna go with a book that I enjoyed last year 
And I was in a good place mentally last year to go along with a theme about like returning to a season that you like. A book that I enjoyed last year was My Lovely Wife. This is a thriller book about this dude. He's kind of a cuck, but it's like, like he likes the situation <laughs> that he's in. Okay, he's like a cuck in the weirdest way. He's married to this woman. And the whole premise of this book is that the way that they s decide to spice up their marriage is through murder. Like they'll just do murder, you know, as a cute little date night activity. And the reason why I say he's a cuck is because she's kind of like the mastermind and like planning everything. And he's just the one like helping it do it for her. But like it works for them. They get turned on by that. So I mean, good for them, I guess. I pretty much binged through the book and I thought that it was a fun book to read because I don't know, there's just something like fascinating about reading this really weird, twisted, messed up couple and seeing the storyline flip between past and present because you get to see like what they're doing, the stabby stabity in present day. But then you see in the past, like how they met and how they developed their relationship and how it came to be. It's very fast paced. It's very easy to read. I did think the plot twist was predictable, but I still enjoyed it nonetheless. And I was in a good place mentally when I read that book last year. I remember specifically that I had just arrived back to California for the first time. I hadn't been back in like three years. I had moved back and I remember I was just sitting on the bus in San Francisco listening to that book on audiobook. And I was just so excited about life and all the possibilities of the future while I was listening to this cuck murder some dude to turn on his wife. Those were good times. Fall is the perfect time for cozy reading nights. Share your favorite cozy reading accessories. So I don't really have any reading accessories except for one, which is my reading lamp. I'm gonna have to cut to a clip to show you because again, my my fingers are sticky, but I like to read before I sleep, which means that I read in the dark and getting this reading lamp changed the whole fucking game for me. It's so useful and it's so cheap too. It was just like $12 on Amazon. It just makes everything so much easier. The last question says, spread the autumn appreciation and tag some people. I am gonna tag the same people that I will be doing booktuber shout outs for because the thing that I do is every time I hit a 10K subscriber milestone, I will pass along the clout <laughs> by shouting out like a small book YouTuber. Last time I did this, I had 230K and now I have 250K, which means that I owe shout outs for two people. The first shout out will go to Victoria Mann. She is kind of like my booktube girlfriend. I feel like I have a lot of girlfriends, but I would say with her, it's like a special kind of thing because she will send me like selfies from when she's taking a bath and I'm like, damn, look at those boobs. Anyway, so I'm gonna give her a shout out as a repentance for sexually harassing her all the time. She's just super sweet. She is just such like a positive person. She is currently writing a novel like I am. So we've been doing writing sprints. She actually created an original book tag called the Awesome Autumn Book Tag. And I totally forgot about that until I started filming this video. So I'm, my bad, but I mean, everyone has done the finally fall book tag already. So if you're looking for something new, check out hers. She also has a series called Escapisms of the Month where it covers not just books that she's really enjoyed, but also like movies and shows and music that she's liked. And then the other shout out goes to Mar from Read With Mar. She is very, very new to booktube. She only has like three videos so far. I think the last one was posted two months ago. So my hope is that if I give her a shout out, that's gonna pressure her to post some more videos. So far she's done month wrap ups and an unhaul video. And I think you should check her out if you need some eye candy cause she's super gorgeous. She's one of my friends from the Netherlands. I'm definitely gonna visit her next time I'm in Amsterdam, but she's just fun to listen to her talk. She's really sweet and really cool. I feel like a lot of booktube is primarily like US centric. So I think if you want to look for more international booktubers, then Mar is a great person to check out because she is just super cool. Now that I think about it, I've also made inappropriate comments to her about her boobs, but I mean, I'm giving them shout outs, so it kind of cancels out from there, right? Shout out to their boobs, but also for their videos because they're cool as people too. And don't actually stare at their boobs because that's my thing. Anyway, I'm done slicing all my mangoes. Wow, the timing worked out perfectly because now we're done with the video. I'm gonna go ahead and eat like five pounds of mangoes now. Ooh, I don't wanna turn off the camera because my fingers are sticky. You're gonna feel my sticky fingers. Oops, oops, clench your butthole, bye. <laughs> Really change everything and all that